um, originalism and marriage equality. Um, but I, what I'd like to say is that Bill is a brilliant scholar who combines an eye for the story, a sort of a, a, you know, this is a book that tells the story of the law through the story of the people. And it's really quite interesting and I learned a lot. And it also demonstrates um, really an increasingly rare quality and it's a quality of the great sold, which is magnanimity in victory. So uh, Bill really was interested and um, like I tell some of the other more conservative voices for marriage equality, gay marriage, this is not, uh, it's not an accident, right? I mean, particularly my co-author um, of our Oxford University Press, Bill, I've got a 50 year old blame. What is John's last name? Uh, anyway. the yeah, Corvino, sorry, My, a good yeah, friend yeah. of mine whose name I just forgot. But he, uh, uh, you know, really it's because these particular voices have a um, affiliation with marriage and a taste for, possibly a taste for tradition and therefore a kind of sympathy of the heart that uh, there could be reasons why this centuries old understanding of what marriage is, that people could adhere to it in ways that were not deeply rooted in a desire to hurt gay people. So I could quibble, but I'm not going to quibble. I could write my own book, but I probably won't. And just say an appreciation and a shout out. I, I do think this is a remarkable book and worth reading. On, on the larger, you know, I entered the gay marriage debate on the marriage side. And I think it was a marker, not that gay marriage is a cause, is necessarily causal, but the public debate was a marker of how committed we are as a culture to the idea that the primary purpose of marriage is to bring together mothers and fathers to raise their children together, that it's rooted in these, these sort of deep human need for a social institution that has that purpose. And I would like to say that, again, I'm not arguing that gay marriage is causal, but the sadness to me, well, I, you know, I think it's been a lovely experience for many gay people, and I like that about it. Uh, the reality is our marriage culture is doing very, very poorly. Our uh, unmarried, there's really only one state that is fighting the trend towards majority of births out of wedlock, declining fertility, collapsing marriage rates, and that's the state of Utah. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I mm -hmm. do think the religious liberty implications, we've always talked about them, and I think that they are potentially manageable, but it depends on whether we, whether there's any sense of magnanimity in victory. Most of what people are asking for is to be able to just keep their institutions, do the good that they wanna do for society um, and adhere to this understanding of marriage. What makes it hard is that we've elevated uh, sexual orientation to the status of race. And while uh, Robin Wilson has pointed out that even on race, we make some exceptions uh, we don't make very many. And uh, the challenge will be moving forward. Uh, well, let me just put down a marker here. I don't think this debate is going to go away any more than the life issue goes away because it is rooted in a really deeply different understanding of what sex means, of what sexuality means, what marriage means. Uh, and although it is clearly now a minority position, um, it's not going to, uh, unlike racism, which of course hasn't disappeared, but has public expressions of which are clearly um, on the decline relative to the 1950s, let me just put it that way. Uh, I, I, I think this is going to be an ongoing issue uh, into the future. We are a minority now, those of us who believe marriage is a union of husband and wife and that its core public purpose is bringing together men and women 
to make and raise children together, clear, clearly a minority, and how this minority is treated um, is unfolding in front of our eyes. But uh, so I guess that's what I'll say and get out of the way and happy to answer any questions that people have about my experience. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Maggie. Thanks very much for that, Maggie. And uh, again, the, the, the book, Marriage Equality from Outlaws to In-Laws, um, uh, this is, it's a lot of uh, material, both legal, historical, sociological. I mean, this is the book, the reference for anyone interested in uh, the debate over uh, marriage and uh, LGBT rights more broadly and uh, other issues going into religious liberty, reproductive uh, capabilities and, and, and things like that. Uh, but uh, Maggie, it's uh, good that you mentioned Utah um, uh, with, with respect to the supposed conflict or perhaps resolution of uh, um, uh, the supposed conflict over, over gay rights and religious rights or, or, or liberties. Uh, there's what's known as the Utah Compromise, which which recognizes um, uh, everyone's rights in various ways, um, and you know I find that quite appealing uh, because Cato happens to be the only organization in the country to have filed briefs supporting both Jim Obergefell and Jack Phillips uh, of Masterpiece Cake Shop fame, uh, and so to me it's very easy to reconcile public versus private actors and everyone treated equally by the government, while private actors can live out their life according to their their conscience. Uh, Bill, do you see that kind of trend line, which at the Supreme Court is perhaps best reflected by Justice Gorsuch uh, as uh, uh, a through way to um, uh, uh, reduce the tension or supposed tension uh, over these uh, competing rights or liberty interests? That's a great question, Ilya. If I may digress for just one minute, uh, I do want to add to what Maggie said that our book, I think, is also the leading account of where Maggie came from in this debate. And she and David Blankenhorn and dozens of other scholars were serious marriage scholars in the 90s, as well as the new millennium, who were focused on advancing marriage as a civic institution. And so they were not coming from a place of, uh, we want to exclude gays. They were coming from a place of, Let's debate about and support marriage. And our book gives you that story, I think, in a way that is very rich and, uh, and helpful for understanding uh, where Maggie came from and the Institute for American Values originally and then for the National Organization for Marriage. Now, Ilya, on your question, uh, with due deference, uh, I have always called the Utah 2015 law a statute of principles. I don't call it the Utah Compromise, though many do. And the reason I call it that is that, is that Equality Utah, the LGBTQ organization, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, businesses and Utah legislators, almost all of whom are Republicans, worked together to address a problem, a couple of problems. One is marriage licenses, and can we have conscience allowances for individual clerks? They worked on that, and I thought it came up with a good answer. And the other was, we have sexual and gender minorities in Utah who are being treated very unfairly, but we don't want to give anti-discrimination protections that unduly sacrifice uh, conscience. And I think, first of all, I think that's a very serious debate. And I'm kind of on both sides, because I, I do believe in God and Christ, and I also believe in rights for LGBTQ minorities. Uh, and I love the Latter-day Saints. I'm Presbyterian, but uh, I love the Latter-day Saints. I've worked with them. Uh, and Robin Wilson, whom you mentioned, has worked with them very closely on that statute in particular. Uh, and it's a very liberal statute offering protections for jobs and housing, not public accommodations, jobs and housing for sexual and gender minorities, but with, I think, appropriate protections for conscience. Uh, Brigham Young, for example, which I think is like a seminary, uh, and uh, the Boy Scouts, which are constitutionally protected by a Supreme Court decree. These are matters of principle. These are not compromises. Uh, another point that was added by the statute, I think, is a principle that both sides can applaud, and that is there's a provision in the statute, which I've never seen in another anti-discrimination statute, that says that employees... Uh, ought to have a right to express their views 
pro and con on things like gay marriage and whatnot without employer sanction unless the employers just prohibit discussion of marriage to everybody. And I like that. I like that. That protects traditionalists at work and it protects uh, sexual minorities at work. Uh, and frankly, I think the Utah Compromise has worked. Uh, I think uh, people of conscience do not feel that they're under great pressure in Utah, maybe as much as elsewhere. And I assure you that LGBTQ people feel that the political system, which is a very conservative one, has been has recognized their dignity and has been responsive to them and is handing out marriage licenses in an appropriate way to the many couples in Utah who want to get married. So I do nothing but applaud it. And indeed, I think, and this is very heretical for a law professor, so you'll have to forgive me. I think legislators, when they sit down and actually work out these issues, do a better job than judges do uh, for the Cato kind of reasons. Judges are not representative. Uh, they don't understand the different points of view. Uh, maybe they don't understand either point of view very well. Uh, and amicus briefs are not a substitute for listening to what groups and the people and, and places like Cato you know, have to say both formally and informally. Uh, now, unfortunately, to finally answer your question, Ilya, uh, Robin Wilson in particular, but me as a supporter, uh, and the Church of Jesus Christ have, have been looking for other windows of opportunity for other state legislatures to do something like the Utah Statute of Principles. But it's been very difficult. Uh, and I would hope that in light of uh, Bostock and in light of Masterpiece Cake Shop, both of those decisions, that that would incentivize gay groups as well as traditionalist groups to go back to the table in at least a few states, it doesn't have to be all of them, at least a few states, and try to work out the next generation of statutes along these lines. A state like maybe Pennsylvania, which does not have an anti-discrimination law, but has many very deeply religious folks who would want conscience protections. Just to uh, clarify for the audience, Bostock was the case decided this past Supreme Court term, uh, ruling that the Federal Civil Rights Act of 1964, the prohibition on adverse employment actions uh, because of sex, includes within that because of sexual orientation and gender identity. And Masterpiece Cake Shop, of course, uh, was from a few years earlier where the court, uh, by a 7-2 to two vote, uh, ruled that the Colorado Civil Rights Commission was uh, displayed anti-religious animus uh, and therefore could not uh, go after um, uh, a baker who did not want to make a wedding cake for a same-sex wedding. Um, we have a question. I'll remind viewers, if you have questions, submit them uh, online, either on the Cato site or through social media, hashtag Cato SCOTUS. We have a question from Facebook. Uh, Andrew Laurie asks, couldn't we just leave marriage to religious institutions and only civil unions are provided by the state? Any couple joining their lives to the state would be legally the same as married, but marriage itself remains a religious term. It seems like the ship may have sailed on that one, but um, Bill, Maggie, why do you think it didn't turn out that way? Um, you know, what, what, what can we do about that sort of thing now? Maggie? Well, Bill, do you want to take... Okay. So um, I think what we... There were questions of practical benefits, but I don't think they were the real question in the gay marriage debate. I think it was a largely symbolic uh, struggle and from the LGBT side of uh, respect, equal respect and dignity. Um, so the there was, you know, earlier there was a movement for civil unions. It folded into the quest for marriage very quickly and very powerfully because I don't really think it was primarily about practical benefits. I, I think marriage was for the gay community and for others who joined with them, a symbol of full inclusion in society. And, you know, symbols can't really be divided or compromised about, they mean what they mean. And I think this symbolic level, oddly, I, I don't know that I ever expressed it, but I think it is a, a uh, sort of profound undercutting of the classic understanding of marriage in a way that's visible every day. Whatever marriage means in the public square, 
it's no longer about bringing mothers and fathers together and this deeply rooted in a, a kind of the, the significance of the procreative meaning of the human body. You could, you don't really eliminate the religious, well, I don't know how it would affect the religious liberty consequences. Um, the reason I believe marriage has always been a public and legal institution is that it was viewed as necessary for the social good. It wasn't primarily, you know, social institutions arise when there's a problem that people can't resolve privately, right? So you have public education because leaving it up to every family to educate their children doesn't work that well. You've got to, you need to create an educated citizenry. And similarly, I think what we have lost, probably primarily due to contraception and abortion, but that's a, the cause is a debatable um, proposition. We just don't see marriage anymore. We don't see this task that is, in my mind, one of the great humanizing tasks of society as deeply and profoundly connected to marriage right now. I mean, some of us do, but most of us do not. Uh, so I think the ship has kind of sailed. I mean, it was not something that uh, appealed to either side. And I think it was because the uh, symbols, we are, humans are symbolic creatures. Sometimes we say, oh, it's just a symbol, it doesn't matter. But uh, in fact, these are the ways we mediate our understanding of reality and experience things that we can't experience in just a practical and pragmatic way. A flag is just a piece of paper or a piece of cloth with some markings on it. But as a symbol, it symbolizes our unity, our history, uh, the, the meaning of what it is to be an American. And I think it's at that symbolic level that the marriage uh, was fight was fundamentally about. Uh, Bill, I I, I, I'll Maggie. let you respond in a second, but I want to add to that. Um, what about going even further and just removing the government from marriage altogether? And were you surprised, for example, if along the way, whether it be Utah or more conservative states like Oklahoma and Mississippi, didn't just say, if an Obergefell happens, we're not providing licenses at all to anyone and let contract law resolve everything. Well, Alabama has kind of done that. They've said that marriages are only going to be recognized by contracts filed with the state. <laughs> they kind really? of did pass a statute along really? this line. Yeah, yeah. It's a bizarre statute, but that's what they did. It's their right to pass statutes. Um, um, and yeah, here's why I think Becky is right, though, that I think marriage has resonance in our culture because of its legal uh, benefits and duties, because of its religious traditions, and because of its social iconography. That, that people grow up, and this was true of LGBTQ people as well as straight people, people grow up with this view of marriage as like this very important thing. Some people revolt against that, some people have no ability financially to do it, and others just live their lives wanting to find that perfect person and to have a nice wedding with a religious official or whoever officiating. And honestly, gay people have had that aspiration as well, probably not in as great numbers as straight people. And I agree with Maggie also that marriage has changed. But I think the argument of our book is the main variable, uh, and this picks up also what Maggie says, variable in the change of marriage in my lifetime has been the increasing economic power, status, and role of women in our society. And that has pervasively affected American families, not just family law, in terms of whether people get married, how many children they have when they have them, whether or not use artificial reproductive techniques or adoption to have children. All of those things are much more prominent today than they were 50 years ago. And so marriage, traditional marriage of, was, was gonna change, it already had changed by the time you got to Obergefell. And here's the interesting thing about Obergefell, that straight families had become more like gay families with fewer children, artificial reproduction, adoption, et cetera. And gay families, particularly lesbian families, where children were born into the families with biological link to one parent, not both, 
were more like straight families than they'd ever been in my lifetime. Not the same, but there'd been a convergence of straight and at least some gay and lesbian lives that made the claims legible to a conservative like Justice Kennedy and many of the lower court judges, Bush, Reagan uh, appointees, as well as Obama appointees, who decided in favor of marriage equality before it got to the Supreme Court. Um, Bill, can I ask as a, as a follow-up, um, how did, getting away from the legalities for a moment, how did marriage go from something that's heteronormative and you know not for the LGBT community to something that's at the heart of the gay rights movement? Well, I think it was a social process that it would not have, that would not have happened. In 1991, I represented a gay couple in DC where y'all are located, Ilya. Uh, and in 1991, why did I do that? It was certainly not a very popular thing. And I was teaching at Georgetown, a very wonderful Catholic university. And the reason I did it is that I knew lesbian couples in DC, not lots of them, but I knew lesbian couples in DC and in my own family. Uh, and they were committed. Some of them were either raising children or planning to raise children. And I was utterly convinced <clears throat> these women would be excellent parents and they wanted marriage at some level, some of them very much, some of them kind of. And I thought these folks would be a credit to marriage as an institution and it would be a good thing for the children they either have or they're planning to raise. Uh, and I think that was a big thing. Uh, Gay men in the 90s, uh, many fewer of them, but some gay men in the 90s started forming families where they were raising children, sometimes biologically conceived within the relationship, et cetera. Um, and if, if that had died out, then the marriage equality would have gone nowhere and it shouldn't have gone anywhere. But I thought this is something a lot of LGBT people want and would be useful for them and useful for their communities and useful for their larger extended families. And that was more true than I thought it was uh, as, as it turned out. And I think that's the reason we won is that uh, it's what we call in the book pop-up homosexuals, that a lot of skeptics or fence sitters or unexpected messengers like the Cheneys and others uh, discovered, well, I have a lesbian daughter and she wants to get married. She wants to have a granddaughter for us or I have a lesbian teacher or a gay um, barber or a, a gay neighbor. Uh, the Kennedys had, a, had gay neighbors. They had a gay mentor, Tony Kennedy did. Uh, and the more normalized gay people became and the more normalized these surprise families became, the more legible the concept became uh, to mainstream audiences, which you don't win these cases if you're not legible to mainstream audiences. Uh, of whom Justice Kennedy is a fairly good exemplar, very mainstream, uh, not, not very progressive, uh, but just kind of a normal Sacramento kind of guy. So I think that's why we won. <clears throat> I don't think it was trickery. Uh, a lot of it was accident as well. I, I, we, we might not have gotten nationwide equality if Kennedy had not gotten the Bork seat you know, in the Supreme Court. We wouldn't have gotten it nationwide, but we would have gotten marriage equality in a lot of the states and maybe from Maggie's point of view, uh, that would have been a better arrangement where the states could have sorted themselves and some could have had marriage equality and some not. And then you see how it works out. So I don't think that's a terrible idea, but that's not the way it worked out. Well, uh, yes, and probably there would have been more accommodation of religious liberty concerns if it had gone through the legislative route. Also, just a, a shout out for, it, you know, the finding the application let's just call it the application of new applications like abortion and gay marriage in our constitution and rooting them there seems to be a mostly one-way game it's just like it always favors uh political or social liberalism and it rarely do we suddenly discover something that that conservatives would like to pass through the legislature but can't muster the support to do. And that's kind of just an overarching background and not gonna you know, import it into this discussion. What I do wanna say is um, the 
two things about how marriage has changed. First of all, our brand new vision of marriage, whatever it is and whoever is responsible for it, is not working out that well for children. I mean, we have close to a million abortions and we have uh, close to a majority of our children now being born outside of wedlock. We've seen the, uh, and mostly most of those are raised without their father's involvement. We see a retreat from male responsibility in the family, which is again ongoing. Um, and so I think that, that supporters of gay marriage would not see gay marriage as being the cause of this. The only thing I would really like to lay down is that the, the hope of some of the more conservative voices in the gay marriage debate, that this would somehow lead to a revival of marriage is clearly not true. And there's a lot of costs to our retreat from marriage uh, in relation to children. There's also a class divide, which I think is really significant now. So the college educated are mostly still getting married before they have children. And uh, they ha they're the ones who have the big celebratory weddings that cost a fortune. And uh, it it's, you know, seems to be serving as some kind of I don't know what the, the, the word is for a, you know, a, 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 mar a marker of uh, commitment and an investment, a sort of an economic investment in each other that does protect the investments that women in particular make in children typically when we have them. Um, and it's kind of new. I mean, I've, we've never seen anything like this, that marriage is becoming the privilege of the upper class, the top quarter of society um and it is fueling inequality generally in society so i'll get off that topic but except to to note that marriage in general again is not doing well um and there are no signs right now of a pathway to recovery thanks let's uh, uh, turn the conversation up, david sure and, yeah david blankenhorn maggie's former colleague uh, very much is a supporter of what Maggie just said. And Blankenhorn has written some very eloquent documents that urging social conservatives, a lot of people cannot afford to get married. I don't know if that's the only reason, but a lot of people, Maggie's exactly right, that a lot of working class and middle class and unemployed people and poor people can't afford to get married. And if we want to encourage a marriage culture, not the only thing, but a very important thing would be providing financial incentives or support or whatnot for those folks to get married, particularly, I think, if they're raising children. As Maggie points out, that is very often the case. <clears throat> to this David Blankenhorn point of view, from, you know, to Institute of American Values, which I think is a very worthwhile organization. Well, we only have yeah, 10 minutes I left. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, Go ahead. I, I want to bring it back. I, do, I want to do one more turn on the law, and it's it's too bad that Steve Calabresi uh, wasn't able to to join us. But he, uh, along with Cato, has has uh, you know, been commenting both in our amicus briefs and beyond today, a pretty basic Fourteenth Amendment case uh, about caste or class uh, legislation. Uh, such that uh, does the state have a good enough reason to delineate the licensing, uh, the marital licenses uh, in this way? And so, in effect, uh, I joke sometimes that for Cato, uh, the Obergefell was uh, an occupational licensing case, much like uh, the economic liberty cases that we litigate uh, in, in other realms. Uh, and that's why Justice Kennedy's majority opinion in Obergefell was to me at least, in many ways frustrating. I wrote a piece for the San Francisco and LA Daily Journal, the, the main California legal publication, called Justice Kennedy was right for the wrong reasons, or for yeah. no real reasons. It's kind of like you take a, a pinch of equality, a scoop of liberty, wrap it in a bow of dignity, and, and voila, it's eloquent. And a lot of people quote that passage for, uh, in their own uh, wedding ceremonies. But Bill, what is the rule of law there? And, and, and what do you think about uh, how the legalities of this were, were framed and, and have come out to be based on Kennedy's opinion? Well, I think a lot of it's up for grabs. Uh, major Supreme Court opinions 
honestly, from Brown versus Board of Education to Roe versus Wade to Obergefell versus Hodges, they're written at very high levels of generality. And both doctrinally and socially, what they mean is going to be contested. Now, what I draw from Obergefell uh, is the idea uh, that is expressed in Obergefell anti-caste idea. Uh, and that is that, that fundamental institutions of government and society, but government, uh, need to be available presumptively to all Americans. Now, the Supreme Court has applied that to prisoners. I think committed lesbian couples with children ought to be given at least that much dignity. Uh, and, uh, and I argued that 20 years ago, 25 years ago, and I still believe that. Uh, moreover, I do think that um, uh, the domas that were before the court were not simply, we're not going to give marriage licenses to gay people. It was, we're going to exclude you from family law generally in those particular four states. They could not do second parent adoptions for the children they were raising. Uh, the state could take away their children in a couple of states. Uh, the state allowed sexual cohabitation uh, and no fault divorce for straight couples. And so it was not protecting marriage very much for straight couples. And it was using gay couples, I think, as scapegoats. And that's a classic instance, it seems to me, uh, where you're on very thin constitutional ground. Now, Obergefell does not pre-resolve the future uh, religious issues, though I think it is relevant to the Fulton case. Uh, Ilya, that's the case, as you know, where the city of Philadelphia has a foster care program. It's a government program. And there are 29, 30 agencies that help place. They're paid for it. They're government contractors, et cetera. One of them is Catholic Services, which says we'll place with unmarried persons or persons and married couples, but we don't recognize same-sex married couples in that latter category. Uh, and that's a tough case because I think that does pit uh, Obergefell's holding that the government has got to uh, recognize the fundamental right of gay people to get married. And there is language in Obergefell, which I think is part of its holding, though this is debatable, which is that that you, the state needs to treat these as marriages across the board. Now, again, uh, that's at, at stake in Fulton. Is this state program going to allow diversification in its application that does not include legitimate, valid same-sex marriages? Or uh, is the court going to uh, say, well, religious liberty in this case and the conscience of the Catholic services group, you know, ought to prevail over this state policy. And I think, and Obergefell doesn't resolve that, but it provides one of the linchpins for talking about that. Yeah, I, I would like to those. say about those, yeah, yeah, those. So that's a question which would be best resolved in legislatures because it's fundamentally about comity yeah. and magnanimity, right? Catholic Charities mm -hmm. is not seeking to block anyone from getting a gay adoption. They're seeking to be, and Catholic Charities in almost every state is considered one of the best adoption agencies. And uh, particularly there are other evangelical adoption agencies that have had the same issues. They work they're very good at recruiting people within their own religious communities, particularly the evangelical Lutheran services. And the, the question is who really benefits? Like on the level of principle in the law, maybe there's a benefit, but in reality, if you let Catholic charities do what it do, does, they will, if a gay couple comes up, they will refer them to the state who will put them in touch with another adoption agency. And the bigger problem is not for, in my view in these cases, and here I'm just demonstrating I'm not a lawyer, is we really need to work hard to find more adoptive parents for children in need. And anything, any principle that's getting in the way of that, uh, it, it, you know, is, is really not serving children or the common good very well. And so for me, I don't know what the court will do for it. Uh, of course, the court is changing. I don't even particularly, see this as primarily an issue of religious liberty. 
because that's like raising it to the level of ultimate principle. It's like in a diverse, decent society, we really ought to prioritize getting as many good people finding homes for these kids. And if that means, you know, there's a gay couples, but gay couples have free access to adoption. I don't like that raising that to the level of, of, of principle on either side, but I'm not in charge of the system. So there you go. My two cents. All right. One, one last question, and this is kind of combines a few that we've gotten on this topic. For example, Nicole on Twitter uh, and earlier Pat Ritter and George asking, uh, what are the chances that uh, gay marriage could be challenged again at the Supreme Court? Does uh, a, a potential Justice Barrett make that uh, more likely? Or the Alito Thomas comments uh, from yesterday, um, uh, will, will, that sh will that shift uh, uh, in any way? Bill, why don't you go first with that? Uh, yeah, I think Obergefell is in play, uh, including in the medium or long run, uh, the Obergefell holding that the states are required to issue marriage licenses to same-sex couples. Uh, you can already count as many as three votes for refusing to give Obergefell its normal reading. There was a case in 2017 involving Arkansas birth certificates where the per curiam six to three court said, uh, no, you've got to treat the married same-sex couples the same. Uh, but Gorsuch, Thomas, and Alito said no um, in a, dis a kind of mysterious dissent uh, because they were really uh, disagreeing with the narrow holding of Obergefell, which involved birth certificates for at least two of the couples. So there might be as many as three votes already. Um, and then you have um, uh, Justice Kavanaugh was added to the court after that. We don't know how he would vote. And if just Judge Barrett is confirmed, then there are as many as five votes possibly to overrule Obergefell. Though Ilya, the more likely thing is they'll do what they've been doing to Roe versus Wade, and that is to hollow it out. The Roberts Court uh, does sometimes overrule, but they usually hollow out the precedent and say, well, it doesn't apply to this, and it doesn't really mean that, and we're going to recharacterize it. You see what I'm saying? And then at some point, it becomes so hollow that it can be overruled. Or you just leave it in place if, if it's not really doing any harm from your point of view. So I think the latter is going to be the approach of the Roberts Court is we'll be giving Obergefell a narrow ambit, which is not necessarily unlawful. Though I do think the dissent in the Arkansas case was not lawful because it was disagreeing with a narrow holding of Obergefell. Uh, the future cases, I think, will not be like that. And conscience claims and other claims that were not adjudicated in, in Obergefell. Well, so you know, I think- Maggie, do you have anything? Yeah, I, I think the very few people would have standing to strike at Obergefell directly, right? Because, and I don't think there's a political will among state attorney generals or governors to go back and re-challenge that decision. I do think that there's going to be probably more robust consideration of, you know, the birth certificate thing has always bothered me because it's supposed to be a certificate of birth. Maybe we need to rename it if we're going to just assume legal parentage uh, in the way that uh, uh, some courts have ruled. Um, but, uh, you know, actually, I, I, probably, I probably think the recent holding in Bolton is probably more in play because uh, uh, there are individual actors affected by that who can get into court and contest that statutory interpretation. So um, it will be a different court for sure. But then again, if the Democrats come in, we may be adding some uh, Supreme Court seats. I do not see the core ruling in Obergefell being challenged in my lifetime. I'm 60, so that's not that long, but I, I think it's here to stay for now. Well, that is certainly what my colleague Walter Olson has argued. He recently blogged uh, at Cato's blog, uh, re-upping his Wall Street Journal op-ed from a couple of years ago, saying that the chances of uh, the courts reconsidering or overriding Obergefell are essentially zero. Although, as Bill, you said, 
uh, it could have limited reach, especially if there are clashes or per perceived clashes um, uh, with religious liberty or, or other uh, issues. Uh, I think with that, we need to wrap up. I'll just note that both my op-ed that I mentioned uh, on Kennedy's opinion, as well as Steve Calabresi's uh, very important University of Miami Law Review piece, Originalism and Same-Sex Marriage, uh, are on our event page. Uh, I'll ask uh, our staff to put up uh, my colleague uh, Wally Olson's piece on uh, chances for overturning Obergefell as well. Uh, and with that, I would like to thank uh, our author, Bill Eskridge. Again, the book is Marriage Equality from Outlaws and In-Laws. Don't let the size of this thing intimidate you. Take it in bite-sized chunks. Uh, there are great stories in here. If we went longer, I would. my next question would have been to Bill to tell us a story or two that people might not know, because this is not a dry legal tome or social science jargon. Uh, this is about stories. This is the inside story uh, of the marriage debate and, and so much more. And thank you to Maggie Gallagher for your thoughtful uh, and, and, and civil commentary, even when there is a disagreement. I think this is a model of how public affairs should be handled. So thanks to everyone for attending today's event. I'm sorry that we weren't able to get to everyone's questions. A, a lot came in. Uh, if you missed some of it, especially uh, due to some earlier technical difficulties, uh, the whole event will be online uh, at Cato's website, uh, cato.org, later today. Um, and with that, we are adjourned. Thank you very much.